much and and uh, nice to see some familiar faces uh, I remember from my visit all those years ago and then some other faces that I've seen uh, on more recent calls so uh, good to have you around and here it's heading towards the evening so uh, as Amy rightly said it's uh, Erev Erev Purim it's actually Erev fast of Esther um, so that's one of the minor fasts tomorrow um, for those of you called Esther, I guess the rest of you probably don't bother. Um, but anyway, it's the fast of Esther. So Purim starts, as we know, on Wednesday evening. I'm not going to try and say how many hours that is for uh, us all. Um, it starts on Wednesday evening, goes through to Thursday evening. Um, it's a strange little festival. Uh, it, um, uh, for example, it doesn't have, if you're into the liturgy, into the synagogue service, uh, we don't sing Hallel, the, the uh, festive collection of psalms, which is normally done on most festivals, done on Hanukkah, let alone the festivals that are mandated in the Torah. Um, uh, we don't say Musaf, the additional service. We don't have one of those um, for Purim. Uh, actually, really, the only difference we make is a little extra paragraph, which is added into the uh, daily Amidah, the, the main prayer of the daily services, uh, and also into the into the Birkat Amazon, the, the benching, the grace after meals, there's an extra paragraph uh, to be said there. Otherwise, um, the main uh, celebratory act of, of Purim is to get together and hear the Megillah, the Book of Esther, uh, which is a fabulous book. I mean, if you haven't read it, guys, read it. I don't mean turn up to shul and hear somebody else read it. But I mean, just sit in the corner and get a good English translation and read it. Because it's tremendous. I mean, it's a really well-constructed story. Why nobody has made a decent film of it, I really don't know. There was one. Um, not very good, I think. Um, well, there may have been others, uh, but nobody's really recognised what a wonderfully constructed plot it is. And we'll talk a little bit about that during the course of today. Um, but as I say, the main celebration that most people know of is that going to hear the Megillah, and you'll be familiar with the practice of stamping out or drowning out the name of Haman. I said Haman. I said Haman! Oh, you're all muted. You can't boo anyway. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Good. All right. Good. Um, so, uh, so that's that's a thing that we're all familiar with. We possibly remember from childhood having a a gragger, a, a rattle, or some other way to make a noise or stamp. Some people in uh, past times apparently used to write the name on the soles of their shoes. So that when they actually stamped their feet, they were literally stamping out the name. So different ways of doing it. Um, there are three other formal halachic uh, observances of Purim. Um, but most of the things that we probably know about Purim are not particularly halachic, not mandated in the uh, Jewish uh, juridical structure. Um, but the three other practices, besides hearing the Megillah read, um, the three other practices are giving gifts of food to friends. This is called Mishloch Manot. Uh, and the technical requirement, those of you who are into the technical requirements, the technical requirement is to give at least two foodstuffs that are immediately edible. So you can't give a can of beans or something, you know, someone's got to kind of open up and cook. Um, two foodstuffs that are immediately edible or drinkable. Uh, so for example, a bottle of wine and a box of chocolates would be just fine. Uh, two foodstuffs to at least two different uh, friends or family. So this is Mishlach Monot, and in many communities, I don't know what happens in Orange County, but in many communities on Purim, you can see people kind of scuttling about from house to house, delivering their little packages and getting home to find another pile of packages on the step uh, as other people have delivered while they're out and so on. It's a lovely little practice, Mishlach Monot, and if you haven't done it, I'd warmly recommend it to you. Take a couple of foodstuffs round to a friend and uh, and encourage them to bring you foodstuffs. Because in the end, of course, you get much more than you give. Um, that's always the way. Uh, the second, uh, the third, so hearing the Megillah is one. Mishlach Manot, sending gifts to others. Matanot uh, la'evyonim, giving 
giving to the poor. Matanot uh, la'evionim. So again, in this instance, you should give two lots of money. Uh, different uh, opinions as to what that constitutes. Two lots of money. Is that two dollar bills? Uh, is it, uh, you know, $20? I mean, what constitutes a lot of money? I think probably two nickels or two dimes would be feeling a bit uh, mean. Um, but two lots of money uh, to the poor in order to enable them to celebrate Purim. So this is not just dropping money into a box, uh, you know, to kind of to support the welfare charity or something. It's enabling people to celebrate Purim. Uh, one of the things that you can also do, it doesn't have to be money. Uh, you know, you could take around to um, somebody needy that you know, a family perhaps that's having difficulty. You could take them uh, a platter of uh, you know, smoked salmon or, or cold cuts or something so that they could have a lovely Purim, you know, bottle of vodka, whatever. Um, that's a nice thing to do. Um, and the fourth thing, so hearing the Megillah, giving gifts of food to each other, matanot uh, levionim, gifts uh, to, um, to the poor. Notice it's not called tzedakah. That's not charity in the classic Jewish sense of doing justice, sharing what you have. This is genuinely helping the poor, just simply that. Uh, and the fourth thing, uncharacteristically and uniquely in the Jewish practice, we have a special festive meal, a Purim Suda. Suda means a, a meal, a feast. A Purim Suda, well, you'd be thinking, well, there's nothing special about that. We have a feast every time there's a festival. We have Seder coming up in a month's time. On Shabbat, we have a Friday night dinner. We, you know, we have festive meals all the time. What is unique about the Purim Suda is that it happens at the end of the day. So all of our other festive meals are particularly noteworthy because they inaugurate the day. So a Friday night dinner begins Shabbat. Um, the Pesach Seder starts Pesach. Uh, we inaugurate the day with a festive meal. But Purim is the only occasion when the festive meal that we have happens at the end of the day. So the Purim Suda, if you planning to have one or even if you weren't planning to, you can now, uh, will take place on Thursday afternoon. So whatever time Purim goes out in, in Orange County, I don't know whether it's six, seven, eight o'clock, um, the Purim Suda should start before Purim ends. So don't invite everybody around for nine o'clock on Thursday night because it'll already be the end of Purim. Uh, have them around at six or 5.30 or whatever time it starts. Here in uh, England where uh, festivals of Shabbat and so on finishing about quarter to seven, we're going to have our Purim Suda about half past five in the afternoon to make sure we get the majority of it. Now, those are the halachic things, but of course many of you will know of other things that Jews do at Purim, which have become part of the practice. And this in many ways is what we're going to focus on during the course of today. Um, probably you know that it is generally encouraged on Purim to get a little bit drunk. Um, now you don't have to get completely ragingly blotto, right? Just a little bit drunk, drunk enough that you don't know whether to bless Haman or curse Mordechai, or is it the other way around? Curse Haman, bless Mordechai. I'm confused already because I've been practicing. Obviously, you know, when you want to do something properly, you don't just do it on the day, right? You practice, you get a little bit drunk every day in order to get to the right level. Now, Maimonides, the great rabbi Maimonides from the 12th century, who was a bit of a, I mean, he was in his own head, really. He was a bit of a head case, Maimonides. So uh, clearly he just didn't know how to have a good time. Uh, Maimonides couldn't argue with this need to get a little bit drunk, so he didn't know. But it obviously didn't appeal to his rationalist instincts. So Maimonides decided that what you had to do was you had to drink enough that you fell asleep. And then, of course, you wouldn't know whether to bless or curse or whatever. I mean, frankly, I think that is missing the opportunity for a good party. But that was Maimonides' view. So you're supposed to get a little bit drunk. Um, and also, you probably know about the practice of fancy dress. People dress up in fancy dress on Purim. Um, classically, of course, people used to dress up as, as 
uh, Esther or Mordecai or whatever. Um, but nowadays people dress up as Spider-Man or, or, or I don't know, whatever, uh, whatever you want. Uh, they wear fancy dress costume on Purim. So Purim has become a bit of a carnival day. Uh, and in uh, Israel, for example, they have big carnival parades, especially in Tel Aviv, famously, the great Adlo Yada uh, carnival parade. Adlo Yada means until you don't know. And of course, that's referring to that um, uh, command to uh, drink enough that you don't know uh, what's going on. So there you go. This is um, uh, this is Purim. Now, I've called this a perfect example of assimilation. If you know the story of Purim, you will know that it is an example of Mordechai and Esther standing up against an anti-Semitic Grand Vizier, uh, Haman, and confronting him, uh, out and proud Jews, um, uh, standing up for what they believed in. After all, Mordechai upset Haman because he wouldn't bow down to him. You know, how can this be a perfect example of assimilation? Surely this is a perfect example of Jewish pride, the very opposite of assimilation. So why do I give it this title? So I want us to go back now to the original story of Purim. Uh, let's locate it. It happened in Persia. Um, it, <laughs> is it history? Did it really happen? Is it a true story? I couldn't care less, to be quite frank. Um, I'm not doing history here. I'm doing Judaism. And that's a very different thing. History is an interesting collection of facts. Um, Judaism is a much more interesting collection of truths, and that's what I'm interested in. All right, Purim has stuff to teach us whether or not a guy existed called Mordechai or whatever. But we have the story set down in the Book of Esther, one of the Megillot. There are five Megillot in the in the Bible. Um, remember, these five Megillot come in the third section of the Bible, so the. The, the Jewish Bible is in three sections. The Torah, the first five books, yes, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those five books are the Torah. Then the middle bit is Nevi'im, prophets, which actually includes books which aren't prophets, like Kings and uh, Judges and Joshua and things like that. Um, but also the prophets, uh, the big ones, the little ones, all of them. And then the last section, which is called Ketuvim, the writings, the scriptures, which is a rag bag of books, collection of stuff uh, that goes into that third section. Traditionally, uh, and I'm, I'm now I realize that uh, Reform Judaism has, over the course of the century and a half, the two centuries that Reform Judaism has existed, uh, it has gone through a number of reviews of how it prioritizes uh, the various different elements of the Jewish Bible. Um, and for a while, Reform Judaism uh, downgraded the Torah in order not to dis, uh, ditch it, but in order to accentuate what it saw to be the very much more important prophetic teachings, the great teachings of the prophets. Um, the teachings of justice and, uh, uh, you know, that God calls upon uh, the Jewish people to attend to. Um, and, and for quite a while, I would say Reform Judaism was very much more interested in the prophetic teachings than it was in the old school Jewish preoccupations with the mitzvot, with the rules of the Torah. Of course, they didn't ignore the essential stories of the Torah, but less, less concerned with the, with the rules of the Torah much more interested in the principles and the values of the prophets. I, I think Reform Judaism gone through quite a change over the course of the last uh, 30, 50 years, um, and is a rebalancing that process and much more attentive, not only to the Torah, but also to the traditional readings and interpretations and ways of learning Torah as well. Uh, but nevertheless, the traditional way of understanding these three sections of the, of, of the Jewish Bible, called in Hebrew the Tanakh, right, which is an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Those three initial letters come together to make the word Tanakh, 
Okay, so this is the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. The traditional way of understanding it is that the Torah is the most important bit, right? The Torah dictated by God, word for word, every single word counts, it, nothing uh, is superfluous or unnecessary. This is the voice of God speaking directly to the Jewish people. The Nevi'im, the prophets, are clearly individuals. Isaiah sounds different to Ezekiel, right? It had a different voice, right? So we are hearing here not the very voice of God. We're hearing the essential message of God transmitted through a diversity of people, right? So the Nevi'im is not the same status as the very word of God, but nevertheless highly indicative. We don't have to take it apart detail by detail, be so attentive, you know, why does Isaiah repeat himself here or that? Well, because Isaiah needed to say the same thing twice. It's not a big deal, right? So we can take the Nevi'im as the second most important bit. And the third section of the Torah, Ketuvim, the scriptures, the last bit, is now no longer the very word of God being transmitted to people, but rather more the inspired voice of people telling us about God. So now we have a third layer, third level of intensity. These third section of books, nowhere near as important to the Jewish people uh, in terms of, um, what should we say, imperatives, as the first two sections of the Tanakh. And where are the five Megillot? Remember the five Megillah, the word Megillah is a scroll, right? So if you want to remember the five Megillot, think of the word reels, which also is kind of like a scroll, right? Reels, it goes round and round and round, yes? A reel. Uh, so the five Megillot, reels, Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Song of Songs, right? The five reels, okay, the five Megillot. Those five books, Nobody would argue that, uh, I don't know, Song of Songs is as significant as the messages of Isaiah or the uh, teachings of uh, Deuteronomy, right? But there it is. And the Book of Esther's in there too. And that third section of the Bible was closed by the rabbis in about the second century CE. So about 1800 years ago, we have records of the rabbis discussing do which books can go in and can't go in. And indeed, a Rabbi Akiva, for example, argued strongly for the inclusion of Song of Songs in the Bible. Right. If he had lost that argument, we probably wouldn't even know uh, Shira Shim, which would be a great loss. So it's very lucky that he managed to persuade people that it should be in there. Uh, the Book of Esther is in there. All right. Um, Although you're all familiar with the fact that the Book of Esther doesn't mention God at all. Come to that, by the way, nor does Song of Songs, but we set that aside. But the Book of Esther doesn't mention God at all. So it's quite interesting that it's in there. I mean, why did uh, the rabbis decide that this wasn't just a great, you know, um, Thousand and One Nights Arabian story of uh, court intrigue? It could have been that. But uh, they didn't. They decided this was a book that had sufficient uh, divine inspiration, as it were, to justify going into the Tanakh, but into the third section, right? So uh, the status of the Book of Esther is comparatively low um, compared to the, the weekly reading of the Torah or the Haftarah or something like that, that we might read otherwise. Okay, so this Book of Esther tells us about an event excuse me, tells us about an event that um, it purports to have happened around 2,400 years ago, right? The king on the throne is a chap called Achashverosh. Now, there is no record anywhere of a king called Achashverosh, uh, except in the Book of Esther. And yet, we have very full and sophisticated records of the history of the Persians. We, we know their history. We've got lots and lots of documentary information. We have an unbroken line of the Persian kings from that period. 
Uh, so either we have to conclude that a Chashverosh is actually just another name for somebody that already existed, or we have to conclude that a Chashverosh is actually a mythical character, he's not a, a real historical personality. Doesn't matter. Many people like to identify him with Xerxes, um, but uh, it's up to you. We also have no documentary evidence outside of the Book of Esther for the existence of a guy called Mordecai or a guy called Haman or a queen called Esther or anything like that, right? So if you're looking for solid history, you're probably looking in the wrong direction, okay? But we don't need to worry about that. What we have in the Book of Esther is a story of a king called a Hasverosh. A Hasverosh is a very mysterious character. First thing to say is he drinks a lot. I mean, he is a real lush. A chashverosh is at it all the time. The entire book is boozed up from beginning to end, right? And a chashverosh starts the book with a party, right? It is a party that is going to last six months. Six months. I want you to think about that. A six-month party. Okay, well, we here in Britain are about to have a four-day weekend in June to celebrate the Queen's 70th Platinum Jubilee. She has sat on the throne for 70 years. Right? Everybody's worried sick as to whether she's going to survive till June. All right, but that's the thing, right? 70 years. Well, you'd say if you've been on the throne for 70 years, you deserve a four day weekend, right? It's not asking for much. Well, that's pretty remarkable. None of your presidents have managed more than 12 years, right? And most of them don't manage more than eight. Some don't even manage four, right? But nevertheless, she's been on the throne for 70 years. That deserves a bit of celebration. What about a Hashvirosh? He's going to have a six month party to celebrate having been on the throne for three years. Now, uh, you must say to yourself when you see this, that we are in the realm of fantasy. This cannot be rational, normal, standard behavior, right? Three years he's celebrating with a six month party. Okay. So he's going to have a six month party and he invites his wife Vashti, now his chief wife, he's got lots of wives, he's, or he's got a harem anyway, I don't know what the legal status is, but he's got lots of women around that he can call upon. But he calls upon his chief wife, wife Vashti to come to the uh, party wearing the royal crown. She refuses. Um, uh, rabbis suggest, and the rabbis are not short of a bit of mischievous commentary, uh, rabbis suggest that she was, she refused because the king had asked her to come to the party wearing only the royal crown. Okay, you with me? Only the royal crown. This is a drunken stag do thing, and Vashti is not going to do it. So she refuses to come. And the king's advisors urge him to be rid of her immediately because if word gets around that the queen can refuse the king's command, women will be out of control completely. Right? It's got to be made that this is a fundamental crisis for social living, right? If women can refuse their husbands when their husbands call upon them to parade naked in front of their courtiers, then uh, it's the beginning of the end of civilization as we know. It, OK, so Akashve Rosh is persuaded, not surprisingly, because the fellow's as sozzled as you like. He hasn't got a clue what's going on. So if they say do this, he does it. Right. And so he puts. Vashti from him, there's much discussion about whether he executes her or just kind of excludes her or whatever. The text is not clear. Uh, but not long after, he begins to realize that he's lost his favorite wife. So he conducts a beauty contest, right? He starts a Miss Universe thing, uh, puts out the word he wants 
all the beautiful women to come and apply for the job of lead wife. So far, so good. All of this completely understandable. Yeah, we're all happy with it. It's the kind of life we all lead on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Mordechai, you remember Mordechai, our fabulous Jewish hero. Mordechai goes to his niece, some say cousin, Esther, and encourages her to enter the competition. Now, I want you just to pause and think about this for a moment. Uh, let us imagine that, uh, forgive me, I don't know what your politics are, and I'm not going to get uh, overly preoccupied with American politics, but I think that we can say that it's improbable that Joe Biden would conduct a wild party uh, at which he'd got entirely drunk and his favorite wife parading in whatever the American equivalent of a crown is and stuff. But we can probably, regardless of our political opinions, we could probably imagine something like that happening with Trump. He's a bit more of, a, of an outrageous character, right? He's more likely to do things which might shock others. He's, he was a man, you know, he, he followed his own path. He wasn't always worrying about attacking to keep the rest of the world happy. So let's imagine, right? Trump decides he's going to have a, a, a beauty contest to bring him the finest and most beautiful young woman in America. Okay. Uh, so, uh, there is a sincere, deeply devout Jew who immediately turns to his niece or cousin, also sincere, deeply devout girl, and says to her, oh, you should go for this. Imagine, you could be in the White House soon, parading naked for the president. Ah, come on, get in there. Now, I don't know about you. But this does not sound to me like the kind of behavior we would normally expect from a from bloke. Right? No, I mean, you can, we can all have our different standards, but I think it's a bit surprising. So who is this Mordechai? What's he doing there, pimping out his niece to a drunken king? What's going on? All right, let's stop for a minute. What is Esther's real name? Well, her name, we're told in the book of Esther, is actually Hadassah. Hadassah is her Jewish name, but Esther is the name by which she's generally known. And indeed, the book is called Esther. Now, all of us, I guess, have a Jewish name and a uh, an English name or an American name, uh, it may be the same, right? Just looking at some of your names, I can see most probably your Hebrew name and your uh, your um, American name uh, could be the same. I see Ahuva, right? It's most probably Ahuva, I, I guess, right? But I'm Clive, my Hebrew name is Akiva. When I'm called up to the Torah, I'm Akiva Abraham Ben Shmuel Alevi, right? But, uh, you know, when the Queen decided to honor me she honored Clive Lawton right so I've got my name in the world I've got my name in the Jewish Jewish community um and we all know that we understand that that's the way of uh, the world we live in isn't it that's what we how we live we have names that are uh, usable by the general society sometimes it turns out to be the same it could be David or Sharon or something uh, and sometimes we have a, a an intimate Jewish name a name that belongs to the families, or where we have uh, a name that works in the wider, wider society. Esther is a case in point. She is known Jewishly as Hadassah, but she's known generally as Esther. But guys, and this is the thing, where does the name Esther come from? Esther is a name derived from Ishtar. Ishtar is the queen of the gods in the Persian system. Um, Ishtar. Uh, in fact, in the books of the prophets, we have condemnation for people who have groves of trees devoted to Ishtar. 
Ishtar is a pagan god. And Esther is named after her. Well, okay, well, these things happen. What about Mordechai? Mordechai doesn't appear to have a Jewish name at all. He's only got the name Mordechai. Mordechai is not a Jewish name, folks. Okay, I mean, it is now, but it wasn't then. There wasn't anybody else called Mordechai as far as we know, uh, certainly not in the Jewish world. So where does the name Mordechai come from? Mordechai comes from the king of the gods, Marduk. Marduk. So now we have our great Jewish double act, Mordechai and Esther, or as we say nowadays, Christopher and Mary. And they are the folk on which the future of the Jewish people relies. Right. They are by their names already significantly integrated, at least integrated, if not assimilated. Right. They fit in to the wider society. They're not uh, a couple of uh, Haredi characters living in an isolated Jewish uh, subculture. They are out there involved in the world. And furthermore, Mordechai says to his niece, get in there, girl. You could be queen. Now, I don't think that's uh, what we would hope that your average responsible Jewish householder would say to a young woman who is under his care. Especially if we know that the court is a fairly licentious, drunken sort of a place. But nevertheless, not only does he say that, he says to her, and when you go in there, you remember this out and proud hero that we've got, Mordecai, don't tell them you're Jewish. Now, I'm not making this up, guys. This is in the book of Esther. Don't tell them you're Jewish. So Esther goes in to the court. She joins the line of, uh, of beauties. And she's selected. Now, look, I, I realize some of you are a little young. I don't want to shock you uh, with uh, too much worldly talk. Um, but uh, for those of you who, uh, who can take it, the rest of you cover your ears. When she is selected, she's not just selected to stand about like a bunny girl in Hugh Abner's mansion, right? She is selected for something slightly more practical and active than, you know, flouting about in a costume. She is selected to behave or misbehave with the king. Okay, let's not lose sight of this fact. And we have to assume, therefore, that not only has Mordechai pimped out his niece, he's pimped out his niece to somebody non-Jewish, in order to have a relationship which under no circumstances could be countenanced as a Jewish act. Now do you start to understand why I say that it's a perfect example of assimilation? What we appear to have is a man called Mordechai with a non-Jewish name, who when he hears that the king is looking for a queen, he turns to the girl who is in his care. She is not only his niece or his cousin, she is his ward. He's responsible for her. And he sets her up to go and seize this opportunity. Right, uh, again, perhaps we might take the uh, Me Too uh, movement and think about the Harvey Weinstein thing, right? If I had a niece, and I heard that I knew about Harvey Weinstein. I'd heard all the rumors about how he behaves towards his uh, starlets and uh, uh, actresses that he gets under his control. Would I say to my niece, oh, you need to get in there and see if you can get a job with Harvey Weinstein. Don't worry about how he behaves. But it'd be great, wouldn't it, if you could get yourself a starring role with Harvey Weinstein. What would you think of me uh, as a person responsible for the girl in my care? That appears to be what Mordechai is doing with Esther. Right. Or as we might say, Christopher is doing with Mary. Okay. They're presenting themselves into this court. Now, folks, 
I don't know whether Achashverosh tended to keep kosher in his castle, but I reckon not. So when Esther goes into the palace, not telling anybody that she's Jewish, I can only assume that for the next little while she only ate salad. Or what? Did she keep kosher in the palace? Or did she not? Did Mordecai set her up to not keep kosher? Or not? She can't say to anybody she needs to keep kosher because she's not telling anybody that she's Jewish. So either she's got to pretend to, uh, you know, keeping up with some strange and fatty diet, or she's going to eat trade, I don't know. So what's going on here? A perfect example of assimilation. Now let's come back to Mordecai. We know that Mordecai is a man of Jewish principle, right? Um, he's an upright, strong, leading Jewish man. And we know this because when Haman instructs people to bow down to him, Mordechai refuses, uh, because as you all know, don't you, we are not allowed to bow down to people, are we? You all know that. Except, of course, it's not true. Jewishly, of course you can bow to a king or a grand vizier. Jews do it all the time. Why would you not? It's respectful. Dina damakwa to dina, the law of the land is the law. You follow the proper practices in, in a society. If you're supposed to bow down to the, to the uh, Grand Vizier, bow down to the Grand Vizier. That's what people do. You think they didn't? Of course they did. So what then is Mordechai doing when he refuses to bow down to Haman? Well, the rabbis are conscious of the fact that this is a problem. One of the, I mean, there's lots of commentary because the book is riddled with challenges and problems. Uh, one of the suggestions that they make is um, uh, perhaps Haman had uh, um, uh, what's, um, idols hanging on a necklace around his neck. And therefore, um, uh, Mordecai was refusing to bow down to these idols. I don't think that Haman was sufficiently clued into the niceties of Halakha as to be figuring out how he could embarrass Jews. It's just, I just don't, it doesn't ring true to me. I think Mordecai was a fairly ignorant, but out and proud Jew in the sense that I'm not bowing down to this heathen. And he uses spurious Jewish justifications for not doing so. Haman doesn't hate Mordechai because Mordechai is religiously committed. He hates Mordechai because Mordechai confronts Haman. We know that there's political tension between Haman and Mordechai. Right? We know that. Haman, Mordechai is not unknown to Haman. We know that Haman has seized power, as it were, become Grand Vizier, much to the great upset of many of um, uh, uh courtiers. Arbona, for example. Arbona is an interesting shadowy character in the court, right? Um, as soon as it looks like Haman's done for at the end of the story, Arbona says to the king, ah, well, if you want to be rid of Haman, he's got gallows in his garden, which he'd set up for Mordecai. You could use that to hang Haman on. I mean, Arbona is waiting for the moment to be rid of Haman. And Mordecai is his excuse by which to do it. What we have in the book of Esther is a classic diaspora story. A story of classic diaspora Jews. It is a story about you and me. It is a story about Jews living in a non-Jewish world, getting on with their lives, making their compromises, right? Or it probably doesn't even feel like compromises, just seeking to succeed until somebody like Haman pushes them so hard, so far, that they finally realise that they cannot not react. 
And this is why this is a story for us. This is not a story about a great Jewish hero. Mordechai, the fabulous, upright, uh, Judah the Maccabee type, who immediately takes up arms and confronts the anti-Semite. It's a story about people like you and me who reckon, you know, you can put up with this a bit. Well, you know, these things happen. Well, what can you do? Well, we'll wait till the other bloke gets elected. Well, you know, he probably doesn't mean everything he says. You know, all of that. We cope with it. We manage as best we can. Uh, we seize the moment to place ourselves in positions of influence if we can. I mean, we've got a niece who could become queen. Wouldn't that be handy? Uh, okay, so she's got to eat trade She probably wasn't too committed to eating kosher anyway. But we're going to be here and we're going to do our best to stay afloat. But there comes a time when you're finally confronted with you've got to stand up and be counted. And that appears to be what happens as the story unfolds. And Mordecai in the end goes to Esther and says, Esther, you're going to have to go and talk to the king. And she says, but, uh, you know, I'm not allowed. And he says, well, fine, then don't. We'll have to rely on something else. Right. He doesn't. He doesn't call upon her highest Jewish values. He doesn't tell her that. You know, that she should stand up for her people. He simply says, OK, well, you don't want to we'll find another system. He does say maybe this is why you became the queen. And Esther goes and uh, joins it. Now, it's a, it is a story, like I say, which is absolutely a diaspora story of all the stories of the Bible. It is the one that fits our modern world best. It is the world we live in. It's the situation that we are surrounded by. It is the occasional appearance politically of anti-Semites, of people who have it in for the Jews, who wish to misrepresent the Jews, who wish to use the hatred of Jews that others can be manipulated in. It's very clear, isn't it, that Achashverosh, the king, I mean, sozzled all the time anyway, hasn't got a clue who the Jews are and doesn't care. Right? If Haman reckons he can deal with the Jews, fine, then do what you like, I don't mind. Not everybody is a rabid anti-Semite. The vast majority of people couldn't care less. Don't know and don't care. And that's clearly the situation in the Book of Esther. And that's the story of Purim. So why do we dress up? Because, folks, that's what we do. We disguise ourselves continuously. We hide ourselves. The rabbis point out that God isn't mentioned because God hides in the diaspora. You can't see God clearly. They, they make a pun on the word Esther because there's a concept of God hiding his face. Hester Pani. He hides his face. Esther. The hiding story. Now, I've only recently learned that black people uh, talk about those light skinned black people who can pass. They call it passing. If you manage to live as if you are white, even though you would be categorized or you come from a family that's black. Well, Jews, of course, pass all the time. Um, <clears throat> I remember going to a, a, an inner city school in London once to talk to the high school kids there. And I said to them, I want you to show a remarkable thing that you can't do, but I can. Most of the kids there were black or Asian um, oh, sorry, when we say Asian, we mean from the Indian subcontinent, Pakistani, Indian, and so on, right? Um, so most of the kids there were brown-skinned, black-skinned. Uh, and I said, I want to show you something remarkable. I want you, you see my kippah? I'm going to take it off now. And look, I'm white. And I'm going to put it on again, and I'm black. And I'm going to take it off again, and I'm white. You can't do that, I said. But I can. I can choose to be white 
or choose to be black. I put on my kippah and I become subject to racism. I take it off and I disappear. I choose to be black. The book of Esther is the story of a bunch of Jews being forced to realize that they are in a racist society, black, like it or not. And that's what happens. The other thing to say, by the way, is it's very clear that the whole thing is about money as well. Same old tropes still going around. Haman says, you know, can take the money. And when Mordecai finally becomes Grand Vizier in Haman's place, the first thing he does is he levies taxes across the 127 provinces of the empire. Why? Because Achashverosh has spent all the money on his stupid six-month parties, on his boozing, right, on his palaces, on all of his ostentatious uh, activity. Right? He's done nothing to earn it. He's spent it all. And so he needs money. Haman solves the problem by going, I'll kill all the Jews and confiscate their wealth. They're a wealthy lot. Achashverosh goes, that's fine. You do what you like. It's a good, good plan. When Mordechai becomes vizier, he levies a tax. Probably doesn't make it very popular, I guess, but there you are, right? Um, so it's about money, too. All of the classic tropes of anti-Semitism, of diaspora life, of the comparative powerlessness of Jews, of the need to curry favour with the powers that be, are there in the Book of Esther. This is our story. It's a story of assimilation and confrontation, a realization that sooner or later in this generation or the next, somehow or other, we're going to be called upon to stand up and be counted. And in some senses, therefore, it drives an imperative for us to turn to our young people and say, don't wait until you're forced. Know who you are and be proud of it. So that not only can you be out and proud yourself, but you can use your Jewishness for the betterment of others before in that famous old poem from the Second World War, they come for you too. Right. So that's my thesis. That's why I think it's a perfect example of assimilation, why I think it's about us why these are not heroic or inspiring people, they're ordinary folk doing the best they can. Uh, and I'm very happy to, um, to finish here. Um, I noticed a couple of things in, in chat. Um, Betsy asked me, uh, had Esther previously been keeping kosher? We don't know, Betsy, that's the point. We know nothing about the Jewish practice of uh, Esther and Mordecai. We hear nothing <coughs> of their Jewish practice. They don't I mean, we don't, they don't go to shul. I mean, Esther asks the entire Jewish people to fast for her. All right. That's a rather strange request. I mean, that's not normally what Jews do. Right. Mordecai uh, marches around outside the palace in sackcloth and ashes when he hears of the decree. And that is indeed a classic form of mourning. Right. But... It's not a classic Jewish response. I mean, it's meant to do something, right? Just, um, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of doing Extinction Rebellion stuff, isn't he? Doing street protest. Um, doesn't he, you know, get, get organized somehow, right? And Esther says, look, for goodness sake, stop dressing like that. You're embarrassing me. Dress properly. You want to come in and see me. And interestingly, nobody realizes that if he's her uncle, then she must be Jewish. That's, this is all very mysterious. Um, <clears throat> oh, and Averill says that um, Esther's list in the Talmud is one of the four most beautiful Jewish women in history. Well, yes, and she's also as listed as one of the seven female prophets. It's very odd. I don't know what any of that means, frankly. I mean, I'm not very convinced by this beautiful women game. Um, you know, I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Uh, but we have rather... Um, uh, I, you know, it's a bit embarrassing for feminists, the Esther story, right, because she's sort of supposed to mince about and utilise her sexuality in order to compromise Achashverosh into doing stuff. Um, 
you know, and, and you end up with this farce moment. Do, do you remember this? I don't know if you, how carefully you've read it. But um, uh, 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 eventually Esther says at a party, again, they're all drunk, right? Esther says at this party, um, when Achashverosh says, what's wrong, Esther? You know, you can have half my kingdom if you don't believe him, right? He says, you can have half my kingdom if you are. I'll give you whatever you like. You're my favorite wife, right? She says, I want you to save my people. He goes, what's wrong with your people? She says, they are being threatened with, with death. This man, Haman, he is uh, going to kill my people, right? Achashverosh is appalled and he storms out, right? Haman, realizing that he's now in trouble, stumbles over to Esther. He's clearly drunk, right? He trips over his own feet and sprawls across Esther, who presumably is not lying on some couch, you know, like La Dame Camille, right? And Haman's kind of sprawled over, drunkenly begging for her. And Achasveros comes back in and he sees Haman assaulting Esther. And I mean, it's a farce. It's a farce. But Esther is in all of this a thing. She's hardly an actor. She's a, 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 a cipher of sexuality. Right? Well, eventually, when Achashverosh decides to do for Haman, he does it not least because Haman sprawled all over his favorite wife. And what's he trying to do? She's a very odd thing. And of course, the rabbis, I mean, the men, it's not surprising, they don't know how to say anything good about a woman except that she was very beautiful. Right? You might have liked something else. Maybe she had a degree in IT or engineering or something, but no, she's very beautiful. Hi, and, I have uh, a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, and Avril's also mentioned that some traditions have Mordechai and Esther as married. I must tell you that the Talmud has them not married but nevertheless misbehaving together, right? I mean, the rabbis in their commentaries on Esther, I think they must have been a bit drunk themselves. Um, the commentaries on Esther are scandalous and wonderful. Um, it really does deserve study, just in order to remind us that it's a little less po-faced and tedious than we sometimes think this uh, rabbinic commentary business is. Yeah, sorry, Amy. Yes, so I have a question. So you're, you're saying that this is a classic diaspora story because the, the people have assimilated until they're sort of pushed to this breaking point. Do you think that Mordecai wanted to be pushed? Like he's setting this up. So he, he's sort of like almost picking, picking a fight almost. To, he's setting this up and sort of wanting this denouement to happen. Do you think that, that there's a case for that? And, and if so, why? Well, it's possible. I mean, I think Haman is not a nice man. And he's not unknown. I mean, so, so um, it's possible that Mordecai wants to confront Haman. Uh, whether he wants to confront Haman because he knows or believes or thinks that Haman is an anti-Semite or not, that I don't know. Um, but there's clearly sort of politics going on in the court. That's clear. There's politics going on in the court. And Mordecai, who is not of the court, but for example, he overhears this plot, doesn't he, at the gates and informs uh, the, the, uh, the court, and the king, um, about the plot. And that's what eventually leads to Achashver Rost remembering that he didn't reward Mordechai and, and all of that stuff, right? But Mordechai uh, is not a powerful character, but he's connected and he has aspirations. So whether he wants to bring down Haman or whether he is a member of the other party, you know, he's a Republican and Haman is a Democrat or the other way around, right? Is Mordecai a mate of Harbona or have they never met? You know, is, is Mordecai uh, one of the kind of um, street activists and Harbona is one of the uh, uh, leadership? And th that's not clear. Um, but it looks like Mordechai is again maneuvering Esther into the court. But he does that before Haman becomes a physio. He's not doing that in order to get an advantage before Haman becomes a physio. Right? Haman becomes busy after that. By the way, Mrs. Haman is the only really clever person in the entire story. She gets it straight off. 
she spots again and again, right? When Haman thinks, I think it's all working now, she says, I don't think so. This is going wrong, right? She spots it. Um, this year, when you hear the story, look out for Mrs. Haman. She's a very interesting character. Nice. Um, we've got a couple of other comments. Time's running on now, but um, uh, ah, Ellen, yeah. Well, Ellen, you want to, uh, you want to. I, I, look, I'm not going to argue with Ellen. You want to keep Esther up there on her pedestal. I'm very happy. Uh, Ellen says Esther seems like an object on the surface, but her intelligence and bravery shines through. You should direct the film, Ellen. That's what you should do, okay? I mean, I, I'm more than happy to uh, prevent women or indeed men only being surface people. Um, that's good because there's stuff that's going on inside. But I think Esther is being trained or has been groomed, uh, to use a very loaded word, into uh, this uh, beauty queen thing. Now, when we, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have ever watched Miss Universe or, you know, whatever it is. I uh, don't even know if it still exists. I presume it does. Oh, it does. Yes, doesn't it? Um, and apparently more of the contestants that go in for Miss Universe uh, turn out to have degrees and are doctors and are just doing it, by the way, while they're, you know, training for their future careers and so forth in the old days. It seemed like, I don't, maybe we just didn't hear about it, but the women seemed to be sort of young, simpering, I want to, you know, I, I believe in world peace, and they didn't really have anything very intelligent to say. We're now told that the women that appear in these things are, uh, you know, have more to them than just a, a surface. Um, and I, I have no difficulty believing that Esther may have had more to her than just a surface. But to be frank, if, if my uncle were to say to me, you go in there and, you know, see if you can sleep with the king. He's a drunken old bloke. Right. I, I would have expected to say, I think not really. That's not uh, my career plan. Um, but she goes and does it. Uh, and I want to remind you that she does it before Haman becomes Grand Vizier. Right. Now, this could all be a brilliant master plan on Mordecai's part, visionarily seeing the future. But it's not written like that. Not written like that. Oh, dear. Phyllis. Phyllis Oster. Esther is the unblemished cow. I presume you're not using cow in the classic uh, no, critical system uh, of uh, misnaming women. Uh, but the unblemished cow. Is that... Um, the uh, the red heifer um, of the Torah. Oh, that's hmm. Uh, the red heifer is a really, really strange thing. Um, uh, we haven't got any red heifers around at the moment. But if you did get a red heifer, you kill it and you burn it. And then the ashes can purify people who've been in contact with the dead. But strangely, um, the people who prepared the ashes then become impure so it's a very very odd mitzvah in the torah very odd mitzvah um the red heifer but esther is the red heifer that's very phyllis can you unmute yourself and say a bit more about that you say a sacrifice can 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 yeah phyllis well i think i think that it's interesting that last week's torah portion was all about sacrifices mm. and in some ways you could see her she's a virgin she's beautiful she is being sacrificed for the good of the people whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. i'm gonna have to drink some more to cope with that um well i like that phyllis um uh I, it's not very jewish though is it um i mean in terms of you know human sacrifice putting somebody on the line in that way um but but I, I i really will have to think about that i love that thank you for this um gosh could it, could it i'm just going to play devil's advocate but could it also be seen as not esther as sort of a victim in this case but sort of wielding her sexual powers like sort of a a sex positive like she's a, a um what's the word she's um 
she she sort of holds this power over Ahasuerosh because of well, her uh, and she's wielding it, perhaps. This is the kind of thing which is said, isn't it, contemporarily uh, in the porn industry and sex workers. Some would argue that uh, women are, as you say, utilising their sexuality in one of the few ways that society really allows uh, for them to be able to uh, actually gain power over men, or at the very least gain income from men, um, uh, which is far better than the uh, prostitution involved in marrying and being in the direction of your husband or whatever it might be, right? Um, there is that argument, um, which is undermined by the fact that the vast majority of women involved in sex work and pornography have very little power. Um, taken overall and for the odd individual who can say look i've earned a fortune or i make up my own mind what i do we know that there's any number of women living grim and miserable lives uh, usually under the direction of some pimp that uh, that directs them um so you could make that argument about esther except that there is virtually no evidence of esther uh manifesting agency at any point Right. It's not Esther who says, don't you worry, Uncle Mordecai, I'll go in and talk to the king. Right. He says, you've got to go in and talk to the king. She goes, he could kill me. She goes, well, tough. It's up to you. I don't think you're going to survive anyway. Right. She doesn't she doesn't manifest in the in the way the story is written uh, power or authority. Uh, we do, by the end of the book, get Esther sending out letters and uh taking the lead with mordecai as grand vizier as queen and um uh giving instructions to the people uh to the jewish people as to how to celebrate and what to do um and at that point she does then st seem to have seized her status accept her status um but and it could be a learning journey for her. I mean, you know, she 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 gets that role, she plays that part, and she begins to realise actually she has more power than she knew. Um, but uh, but I think that's a slow process. It's certainly not yeah. evident from the outset. Uh, we have, one. I think, a point from Marcia. Yeah, or, let's take that one, and then and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Hi. Um, she does manifest agency. She sets up the conditions for the parties, quote unquote, the mishte, that she makes with Haman, who she invites, like, wait a second, where is she coming off inviting this guy? The king doesn't even realize that. Um, she has set up the conditions. Not only does she set up the conditions, she drags it out by saying, I'll tell you tomorrow. So if that's not man if that's not manifesting agency, what is? Well, Marcia, I, 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 I Marcia, Marcia, um, I accept that um, up to a point. I, I think I've always read it differently, um, which is that having uh, having accepted that she is indeed going to tell the king of the plight of the Jews, uh, she bottles out. Um, uh, you know, the king says, what do you want? What, what would you like? Just tell me what's worrying. And instead of saying, look, you know, my people are in crisis. She says, I want you to come to a party. Right? Now, well, that's a good, a good line for the king, because a party is always good for the king. Um, and she invites Haman too. Haman misreads that and thinks he's in there on the inside track. Uh, you're right. Um, now, of course, this is also just wonderful narrative stuff, dragging the, the denouement out. Um, but she doesn't tell the king straight off. They come to the party. The king says, what is it you want? And she bottles out again. She says again, um, uh, I, well, I want you to come again to another party tomorrow. Right. And finally, she, she thinks, I can't keep doing this. I've got to tell him the truth. I've got to tell him what's going on. And so she finally tells him. Um, so my reading has always been that she's been given a job to do. She doesn't feel courageous. She doesn't feel strong. She doesn't feel in control. But, but if she doesn't say something sooner or later, I mean, she's already taken three days to get around saying it. If she doesn't, he's going to, you know, we're going to be back to the Vashti story. She's going to be off with her crown and who knows what. Um, so, so she has to do something. And probably Mordecai is also kind of ringing her up each day and going, so, no, what happened? Did you tell him? And go, no, I could not today. I'll do it tomorrow. Right. Um, so, 
I think she has to do it sooner or later, but I don't think it, she looks like a kind of heroine going out there and doing it. But I like your point that maybe she's, uh, she's a grand manipulator. That's kind of cute. But um, I think we're desperately trying to save our heroes here. I'm telling you, junk them, get drunk. <laughs> So with that, let's wrap it up. And Clive, thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation. It's so nice to see you and learn with you. And um, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Ari will be back on Thursday at 1230 Pacific with Professor Sarah Bunen Benor, um, who is talking about pastrami, verklempt, and uh, some other stuff, non-Jews use of Jewish language in the United States. So there you go. That's Thursday at 1230 Pacific. It's a chutzpah. Yes, there yeah. you go. <laughs> um, so um, thanks, everyone. Have a great day and Hag Purim Sameach. Yes, have a lovely Purim, all of you. Thank you for including me. Bye bye. Hag Purim Sameach. Bye. Thank you, Clive. Bye bye. Thanks, Anita. Hi, everybody.